So the topic of our webinar today is on transformation points, um, achieving the speed and scale required for full decarbonization. And joining me to present our work is um, Nicholas Huna from New Climate, Bob Brecka from Climate Analytics, and Yannick Monchar from ECOFIS. And we'll be presenting a recent report that we've published um, which looks at this topic. Slide. Um, so the Climate Action Tracker is probably best known for first our country analysis where we track climate progress um, in a number of countries across the world and rate climate targets. And then also, next slide, for our global temperature update, which we do usually annually and where we look at what the temperature increase at the end of the century would be under, for example, current policies where we see based on the results of our update that we did in December that we would make it to between three and three and a half degrees now. Pledges and targets, so countries' climate targets under the Paris Agreement would get us to between 2.7 and 3 degrees. But what we're aiming for with the Paris Agreement um, and to avoid the worst impacts of climate change is to limit warming to below 2 degrees and striving for 1.5 degrees. And so when we look at those pathways, the green and yellow pathway on the figure, we see that we really need to accelerate action um, to close the gap between where we're headed now under current policies and where we want to be at the end of the century. And for us at the CAT, it's really important for us to do work that not only points out where action would need to be scaled up or where that gap is, but also to participate in trying to find solutions to those issues. And so we have two report series that we're in progress on right now. The first is our Scaling Up Climate Action Series, which looks at six different countries um, and looks at specific actions that those countries could take to raise their ambition um, and reduce emissions. We have the South Africa, report, South Africa report already published, as well as the European Union report, and Argentina and Indonesia will be coming up next over the summer, followed by um, Turkey and Australia later this year. What we're here to talk about today is a new report in our decarbonization memo series. Um, this is work that's funded by the Climate Works Foundation, and so far we've looked at what needs to be done in seven individual sectors to decarbonize them um, in line with the Paris Agreement. So we've looked at passenger transport, buildings, natural gas, industry, agriculture, appliances and lighting, and heavy transport. And all of those reports are available on our website. The focus of today's webinar and our most recent report is on transformation points. And so we know that we really need to change the global energy system into a completely new state and that that needs to happen at high speed and on a large scale. So the question is, how can we get there? And so for the webinar today, we'll have the following agenda. First, um, my colleague Nicholas Huna will talk about transformation points as a concept. Then I'll present on the power sector, looking at why we need a breakthrough in electricity storage technology. Next, we'll move on to the transport sector with a focus on passenger electric vehicles. And finally, look at the industry sector, where we're going to need both new and existing solutions. Finally, um, a quick introduction to our decarbonization data portal where you can track um, progress for a number of indicators yourself, and then we'll have time for questions and answers. And so with that, I would hand over to Nicholas to introduce us to the concept. Yeah, thank you very much, Lisa. Nicholas Söhne here from uh, New Climate Institute, part of the Climate Action Tracker team. And uh, yeah, as Lisa said, this uh, memo that we have uh, been writing and that's available on the Climate Action Tracker website is really about transformation points. And uh, the whole idea is that, well, technology is spreading uh, in, in a certain way. At the beginning, it's usually difficult to get there. And once you have uh, come across a, a certain hurdle, then it basically the uptake uh, goes up exponentially and then at some point saturates. 
Here on this figure, you see a few of technology transitions. It's for households in the US uh, on the you know, you know, different things that they have been using. It starts from the telephone, goes through refrigerators, clothes dryers, in the end VCRs or computers, and in the end uh, cell phones and internet. And what you can see is usually it's, it's a S curve. No, it's starting slow at the beginning, then really picking up speed and at the end accelerating. And another thing that yet you can see here is that it, things speed up. So the transition can be quite quick, especially for cell phones and internet, the, the growth is extraordinary and reaching 100 uh, or full 100% uh, quite quickly. And this concept of an S-curve or a transition following an S-curve after a transition point is what we took up in this memo to, to develop it a little bit further to the issue that it is, is at hand. For the Paris Agreement, we basically need to turn upside down our energy system completely. We need to go from fossil fuel dominated energy systems away to complete fossil free energy systems. And that as quickly as possible globally until 2050 in some sectors even faster, some sectors and countries even faster. And I think that is only possible if we think about these very quick transitions that take this exponential speed um, and then really can turn uh, things completely around. And for that, we, we uh, show in this picture here the, the S-curve that you see in the middle. So that's the technology deployment from small to large shares. And on the top, you see the effort. So in the beginning, the first mile is always very, very difficult. You have a lot of efforts. You have some setbacks. Sometimes you have some, some positive developments, but then it, it goes back. Uh, and then uh, at a certain point, when we call these first two phases initiation, initiation and then development, but at a certain point, you reach this transformation point. And then what used to be uh, uh, innovative and novel uh, all of a sudden becomes the new normal and then the exponential take up takes off and uh, we uh, reach this take off phase where uh, adoption increases rapidly and then the completion phase where it's basically saturated. The important element here is that, well, it's difficult at the beginning to get there. So there's a lot of effort needed in the beginning, but once that effort is uh, overcome and done, it may become easier and others that have not contributed to the effort at the beginning may be using these technologies as well because they simply have become cheaper or better than the alternatives uh, out there. Now, if you look at uh, climate change and the technologies that we need for that, in the paper we looked at a few uh, basically to say where are we right now in this transition um, and uh, just for uh, and the point here is that they are not all these transitions that we need to zero technologies, zero emission technologies, they are not at the same status, they are at, at different ones. So uh, probably FERB's advanced is um, uh, renewable electricity, um, where we are almost at the stake of uh, takeoff phase. Um, I think uh, renewables as such have become already so cheap that they can compete in many areas with fossil fuels, so newly built is, is definitely the new normal as renewables. But with storage, it becomes a bit more difficult and uh, we'll hear later on uh, more details on that. Then another example would be uh, electric bicycles. They are definitely on the takeoff. Uh, they are uh, on, on a very high increase uh, of uptake right now. Uh, and electrification of passenger vehicles. That's another of the main topics that you'll hear more about later. It's close to that takeoff point. One could say they are already beyond it or not, but at least there's still a little bit more to do. But other technologies are not there yet. And uh, I think we can learn from the existing ones that are already advanced, what we need to do to those ones that are not so advanced to move them across this transformation point so that they can really have big impacts. And the ones where we still need to do more are, for example, electrification of freight vehicles, uh, zero emission buildings, high intensity heat, or direct air capture. Uh, before uh, we now go into the three different sectors, I want to uh, quickly highlight the key messages uh, right now, and I will come back at the end again. So first, uh, I have five, five different messages. One is 
Well, this transformation point is, uh, as we defined it, uh, is the moment where the previously novel becomes the new normal. And we think it's very important to think about these transformation points to move technologies to this point so that uptake can really accelerate. And this is an important task and ask for front-runner governments. Um, this can be done by an ambitious set an ambitious subset of governments, um, if this subset has the critical mass and is ambitious enough, it can move the technology development and therefore change the global picture of this technology uptake with positive implications for all countries. So this is uh, not that we can only act if all act at the same time. This is the complete opposite. This is if a small group of very ambitious governments moves a certain thing ahead with a lot of effort with, with a lot of ambition then this can make change globally and also take those along that in the beginning didn't really want to go that route on the three areas that we look at um, as we said this is important we need to move it forward and uh, what can governments do to bring these technologies to the transformation point uh, on renewable energy with storage, um, we see that uh, many governments still need to set up their market rules so that storage becomes attractive and can compete um, in the market. Uh, helping would also uh, to set targets for storage capacity additions and to invest in um, technologies, especially focusing on interseasonal storage. I think the short-term storage with batteries uh, that we have huge advances, but there's still a big issue on interseasonal storage. Then on electric vehicles, that's our second element that we look at in more detail. Um, their uh, front runners are countries like Norway, but also California and uh, China are, are doing quite a lot and uh, ways forward. If governments want to move things towards the transformation point are financial incentives, but also uh, equally important uh, charging infrastructure. Without that, it will not really move forward and other benefits for electric uh, mobility. And then the last one, industrial emissions. This is really diverse and not at a tipping point at all yet. And uh, there the two recommendations that we would have is to work with industry to demonstrate the feasibility of technologies at a local level. So at this feasibility stage, really show that it's possible. But uh, also, most importantly, provide financial incentives for the development uh, of the technologies and then also the deployment of that uh, technology, like a fixed incentive that gives a long term certainty for uh, these technologies to be developed. Uh, the feed in tariff that we had in renewables, for example, could be used here. With that overview of the paper, I hand over to Lisa Luna, who will explain us more about renewable energy with storage. Lisa. Indeed. Thanks, Nicholas. So exactly, the first sector that we'll dive into in more detail is the power sector, um, where we really need this breakthrough in energy storage technology. Slide. Um, so we see that shares of renewables are really increasing. Um, in certain regions of the world, like Denmark, for example, um, they already hit 51% variable renewables. Um, in 2017, and you really see that how that F S curve developed in Denmark between 1990 and 2017 in the left-hand panel. But even in the rest of the world, shown in the far right panel, um, you see that the renewables have really started to pick up. And we know that, for example, twice as much renewable capacity as fossil fuel capacity um, was commissioned in 2017. Solar and wind are now cost compatible with fossils in many regions. In some regions, it's even now cheaper to build new solar and wind than to continue to operate existing coal. So there's quite a bit of good news coming out of renewables. However, um, electricity systems that are dominated by renewables, and particularly variable renewables, function in really different ways than fossil-based systems. So when you have a lot of generation from renewables, so especially, for example, 100% renewable systems, you need to be able to balance supply and demand. So wind generates a lot when the wind is blowing, solar generates the most when the sun is shining, 
um, the question is how do we then shift that energy that's made, for example, in the middle of the day to the time when we use it, when everyone goes home in the evening and turns on their TV or starts cooking with their electric stoves and then we get a big spike. Um, and so as we move towards these systems with very high shares of renewables, we need to address those issues um, in addition to some other issues. And energy storage can really come in there and change the game. It makes it possible to get to these higher shares of renewables and helps overcome some of the issues that previously made certain people say that 100% renewable systems wouldn't be possible. So next slide. Um, in Paris Agreement compatible scenarios, so scenario analysis, we see that um, in many scenarios, the power sector CO2 emissions are nearing zero by the early 2040s. So this is a more rapid transition than needs to be seen in other um, sectors. And what that means, zero emissions in the power sector has to either be 100% renewables or you need to see an expansion of nuclear or um, CCS proving itself to be truly zero emission and economically viable, which hasn't happened yet, meaning that renewables are likely our best shot at the moment. And so we here especially focus on this 100% renewable scenario in 2050. And in order to get there, so that's the first panel with the renewables, in the second panel we see how much storage could be needed um, in that scenario. So it's estimated that you need to cover up to about 6% of your annual electricity demand with storage in a 100% renewable scenario. And compared to the amount of storage that we already have installed today, that means that storage needs in 2050 could be up to 475 times higher than what we have installed now, depending on which other flexibility options would be used. So this is a big task. That's why we really need to start approaching this transformation point in storage. But the benefits would be clear if we did manage to completely decarbonize the power sector by 2050. We would save about 13 gigatons of CO2 emissions per year, and that's about as much as China admits today. So that's where we want to head. Next slide. There's good reasons to think that storage is also headed for a transformation point. So the first reason for that is that energy systems will need storage, as I've just been discussing. So as climate policies, as renewables prices drop, um, continues to push renewable shares higher, one will need to install storage to go along with that. So it's an enabling factor, and it will also benefit from that. Second, the technology is available. There's lots of different types of technology for storage. So batteries have gotten quite a lot of hype lately, but you can also look at very classic options like pumped hydro storage um, or options that are available for more long-term storage like power to heat or power to hydrogen. Um, Third, prices are dropping. So prices for lithium ion batteries, for example, fell from about $1,000 per kilowatt hour in 2010 to about $200 per kilowatt hour in 2017. And um, prices for other storage technologies are also projected to drop quickly in the future. Regional policy supports storage. So certain governments like California have a target for storage installations in the future. Um, fifth, Consumers demand storage, so many people who are now installer, installing solar home systems also install a behind-the-meter battery with their solar home system. I recently saw that you can even purchase this from IKEA now, so that's becoming quite mainstream. Um, and each of these individual home units also adds to the collective storage capacity. And then the sixth point, which Bob will get to later, is that electric vehicles will provide some of it. So as you have more electric vehicles on the road and they're plugged into the grid and can charge and also give back some of the energy that they're storing, that starts to help increase our amount of storage capacity. But we're not there yet. So what do we need to do now to get storage to this transformation point? The first is that governments and energy regulators need to modify market rules that allow storage to compete. So storage can provide not only electricity to the grid, but other ancillary services that other power plants are paid for, such as frequency regulation um, and 
constructing the market rules in such a way that allow storage to participate in those markets um, helps to increase its competitiveness. Governments can also provide financial, assessment, it, financial incentives to help attract investment. Second of all, governments can follow front runners like California or, or New York and set targets for storage capacity installment. This should accompany a long-term vision for decarbonizing the power sector. Third, governments and industry can invest in R&D for storage technologies and particularly with a focus on interseasonal storage. That's really the next big hurdle in storage is figuring out how we can store electricity or energy to produce electricity, not just for four to six hours over the course of a day, but for several months during a year. And fourth, um, deploying large scale demonstration projects can prove that this works. So that was really the case in South Australia, for example, where Tesla installed a very big battery and um, the Australian government followed up that project because it was so successful, even helping, to, helping the grid to avoid blackouts. They've followed it up with um, contracts for several more large batteries. So seeing it done once really helps convince people that it can work. So at this point, I would then hand over to Bob to go into detail on electric vehicles. Thank you, Lisa. Yes, I'm Bob Brecker representing Climate Analytics on this paper, on this project, and I'll talk a little bit about the transport sector and how we need to increase the diffusion of, of passenger electric vehicles. And as, you've, as you will notice as we progress through this, the, the, we're going to sectors that are slightly less far along the curve. So the, the electricity, renewable electricity and storage was further along the RS curve. The electric vehicles are slightly less far along that, but we can see still some of the things that are, that are necessary to, to push us further. Why is this important for meeting the targets of the Paris Agreement? I think that a lot of times for energy system transformation, we, we think first about the, the power sector and solar PV and wind as being keys to, to energy system transformation, which they are. But one of the things that is underlying the, the whole paper and the, the three con contributions we're making here today is, is that the future energy system will be much more strongly coupled than is the case today, rather than, than having simply petroleum feeding into the transportation sector and, at least historically, coal and natural gas and nuclear power, the electric sector. Now we're going to be coupling between those sectors and, and seeing a, a more complex, but I think really, if designed well, a more flexible system, a system that can, can adapt to, for example, high percentages of, of, of variable renewable energy. And as, as Lisa already pointed out, one of the ways this will happen, this coupling will happen, a back coupling, is that as electric vehicles become more prominent, then they will also help potentially to assist with electric grid stability as a storage option. Um, I think as well, this is an important sector because it's, it's a much more clear pathway forward than, for example, what Yannick will talk about in the industry sector where we know that we have to get away from petroleum and we have to switch the, the, the sector to other options, including what we'll concentrate on here today, passenger vehicles that are, that are electrified. So it, so it really represents something where we, we kind of know the pathway forward, we know what's going on, and we know what needs to be done for the future. The other benefits of this, we have to always think about the, the um, co-benefits as well of, of, of the new transformation in the energy system, and that is we will be eliminating a lot of other harmful pollutants beyond CO2. And really one of the key key things that, that I always like to point out is how much more efficient electric motors are than internal combustion engines. So as we switch from, from electricity that is, is fossil fuel based to renewable based, and then from transportation that, that is internal combustion engine based to electricity based, we're also decreasing our primary energy use significantly by making that transition. And again, that's an important part of this. We become more energy efficient, but also more, more CO2 efficient, in fact, heading towards zero CO2 emissions. Next slide, please. So we ha have an example here of of how this, this transition can look. 
Um, in this case, what we're looking at is the is the an example of of actually global EV seals and pen, and and fleet penetration, and the S curve in this case is on the left. The solid line is EV sales which take off. We're now at the very beginning of that curve as we see down in 2018, 2019. But we can imagine a penetration going up much, much faster. We see already a country such as Norway is, is past the 50% mark in new vehicle sales for electric vehicles. So they have progressed along. This gets to the point that Nicholas was making that we need to think about the front runner countries, the front runner governments and, and, and policies that will take us up the S curve. The other point um, I'd like to make along with this is that, I mean, two, two additional points, is that the fleet will lag the sales because there are many existing, uh, many existing vehicles that need to be replaced over time so that the dashed line of the EV fleet will, will lag in time that of the, of the sales. But we also see that this transition can happen very quickly again, as was pointed out earlier, because some countries are already implementing policies to end internal combustion engine sales by the 2030s. This only is possible if there is another alternative, and we see already that the electric vehicles are a, a good potential alternative for, for this transition. And finally, at the bottom of this figure, we see that the impact on emissions, and this is admittedly as an extreme case where we show a total fleet without any um, EVs, but fleets will grow around the world over time. So without any changes, without any policies, then emissions would grow in that sector. Now we can see how over time this, this total fleet emission load will decrease as EVs start to penetrate further and further into the system. We show a kind of S-curve transition here in the opposite direction to low CO2 emissions. Next, please. This is just taking some projections from the, from the Climate Action Tracker and looking at this in two different regions, the U.S. and the European Union. And what we see again is that, there, that, that the projections for business as usual don't get us to where we need to go. The, what we need to have is really a, a transformation. We need to have a transition to a new state which is the low carbon state. That's not going to happen by simply following the dashed lines of improving, for example, in the US and European Union, the efficiency of existing light duty vehicles in the fleet. We need this transformation to the EV fleet. If we advance once, Takeaway number one from this is that there is a lot of inertia in the transportation sector. Vehicles last a long time, so we need to start the transformation process now. And it is happening in some, in some isolated areas. Takeaway number two is that behind these CO2 reductions in the electricity sector, the solid lines in this graph up above, we see that the power sector has to be decarbonizing at the same time. Even in most places in the world right now, on the existing grid, electric vehicles will result in lower emissions than, than comparable internal combustion engine vehicles. But to get to this real transformation, we need to couple the decarbonization of the power sector to the electrification of the transport sector. Both of these have to happen at the same time, and they have to be going on in parallel, not sequentially. It's not one or the other. It's both of the systems working together and, and advancing in, in concert. This is where we are, but what is it that we need? Where, where do we have to go? What are the things that we can see will be needed for the future? There's a parallel development, as I've already mentioned, but it comes down to a combination of policies and technologies. Longer ranges in electric vehicles will lead to higher consumer confidence. That turns out to be often a smaller problem than initially is thought. Initial financial incentives improve affordability of buying the vehicles, so that's the upfront cost. Operating costs are already lower for electric vehicles in all regions, essentially. So this is, this is a matter of, of getting over the hurdle, as we talked about at the very beginning, a first hurdle of thinking about the affordability of the upfront cost. Infrastructure, as Nicholas pointed out, is critical. The charging stations, Tesla has their stations across the U.S. and across other regions, but infrastructure to increase convenience and make people simply get used to the, the new technology and how it operates, how they can use it in the way they are accustomed to. 
Policies will help remove barriers and skepticism, um, parking, driving lanes as they've introduced in Norway and in California for electric vehicles allowed to drive in high occupancy vehicle lanes, ease of installation of chargers as they've done in, in the Netherlands where if you have a vehicle you can apply to have a charger installed near your home, even in the middle of the city carbon pricing on a macro level, all of these things will help to, to drive the transition, especially over those first hurdles. As the, as, as the demand increases for the vehicles and larger fleets are, are, are um, accomplished, then this leads to lower costs through learning effects, as we've seen with solar PV, for example, and wind, and then neighbor effects. This making, making the technology normal instead of exotic is not to be underestimated. The more vehicles there are in, in a given neighborhood, for example, the more they will appear to be the normal and more people will want to buy them as they see the other benefits. And then this cycle repeats. However, we do realize for all of these tipping points, for all these transformation points in the system, that we have to keep the efforts going. It doesn't happen by itself. It accelerates, but we do need to continue with our efforts going forward. And now to move to the next sector, Yannick will talk about industry. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Also, welcome from my side. Uh, my name is Yannick Monschauer. I'm a senior consultant at uh, Navigant and also part of the Climate Action Tracker team. Uh, so now we look at uh, the industry sector, where um, the low carbon transformation is less advanced than the other two sectors that we already looked at. Uh, but there are also some promising developments, um, and I'll follow the same structure. So we'll uh, first look at why the sector is important for decarbonization. Uh, we'll look at where we are now and uh, also what has to be done. So uh, why is this sector important for limiting global temperature increase to 1.5 degrees? Uh, first of all, industry is the largest CO2 emitting sector. Uh, when you also consider electricity emissions, uh, that's even before buildings uh, and transport. Um, and although some progress has been made in uh, some subsectors sub and regions, um, industrial emissions still need to be reduced at a much higher scale and speed. Um, the graph at the bottom right shows uh, you that uh, there has been some progress in cement, for example. So um, China um, has made quite some progress in terms of uh, emissions intensity, uh, less so in the U.S. Um, and um, yeah, on, on average, uh, it has been around 10%. Um, um, uh, in, in the past 10 years. Um, however, this is uh, not uh, fast enough. Uh, also, when you look at the scale, so this graph is starting at 450 um, kilograms of CO2 per uh, ton of cement uh, rather than uh, zero. So yeah, there's still a long way to go. And um, in fact, uh, CO2 emissions from uh, industry need to re be reduced by 65 to 90% um, for a Paris compatible uh, pathway. Um, and all this while industrial production is expected to grow significantly. So uh, global cement production um, is expected to grow by around 20%. That's what you can see on uh, the upper graph. Um, steel production is also uh, expected, to, uh, expected to grow by around a third uh, by mid-century. Um, so why um, uh, are there so, uh, such specific challenges um, in the industry sector? Uh, first of all, um, we have uh, technical challenges uh, for large industrial uh, installations. So emissions are often intrinsically linked to the production process, for example, in, in cement production. Then you also have um, economic and financial challenges uh, like high costs uh, and uh, competitiveness uh, uh, issues um, that uh, uh, yes, limit uh, policy action. And um, uh, organizational issues. So for some of the new technologies that will be required, um, new uh, partnerships uh, by industry will also be required. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. Um, so where are we now? Um, in most subsectors, we are still far off from, uh, from a transformation point as uh, discussed in the previous chapters. Um, there are, however, some, some promising uh, examples uh, of uh, existing solutions that uh, some of you will be familiar with uh, that can already deliver uh, quite some uh, important emission reductions. Um, for example, in the cement sector, uh, low carbon fuel switch, um, so switch switching to uh, biomass um, and, uh, uh, and waste fuels uh, uh, can help reduce emissions. Uh, there's also potential for the uptake, and it's already quite um, widely uh, deployed in, in some countries. 
uh, like uh, Poland here, I think you have a, a share of about 60% uh, in the fuel mix uh, already. In the steel sector, um, there are um, options like electric arc furnace uh, steel making, um, but still all these options are not um, sufficient and uh, innovative solutions will be needed in addition to and uh, will need to be scaled up. So uh, for clinker production uh, or for cement production, um, clinker substitution uh, could be an option. Um, that's, uh, that would reduce the, the, the clinker to cement uh, ratio and also uh, reduce uh, emissions this way. Um, in, in the steel sector, uh, fossil fuel st uh, steel making based on hydrogen um, and renewables uh, could, uh, could be an important option um, in, in both uh, cement and steel sectors, but also in other subsectors of industry, uh, carbon capture and storage, uh, but also uh, utilization of carbon uh, will probably be required in, in the long term uh, to reduce uh, emissions um, at scale, uh, but uh, yeah, this uh, is also still um, at an early stage. Um, if we go to the next slide. So um, what do we need uh, to do to reach uh, the tipping point or at least to get closer? Um, first of all, we need clear policy signals. Uh, so uh, long-term policy um, um, strategies that uh, include the, the industry sectors are, are crucial here, um, but also um, a group of uh, ambitious regional and uh, national or local governments uh, should incentivize the demonstration and deployment of low-carbon solutions. So on the one hand, uh, you can have uh, innovative policies such as uh, subsidies per ton of emissions reduced for new industrial technologies, um, and the Dutch, uh, Dutch government is, is currently uh, planning to implement such a scheme um, uh, to promote climate-friendly technologies. But on the other hand, uh, you also need uh, carbon pricing policies that can, uh, can facilitate uh, innovation by providing uh, long-term certainty. In addition, um, you would need uh, new partnerships between key industrial actors um, and um, uh, partnerships along uh, the value chain uh, to overcome uh, organizational barriers. So for example, in the steel or chemical industry, um, that could help to develop uh, hydrogen-based uh, solutions. But uh, you could also work together uh, with governments and utilities to build a uh, CCS infrastructure. Um, either way, most solutions in the industry sector are not irreversible, so uh, a constant policy push will be required in the coming decades. Uh, finally, so last slide, um, I would like to show you uh, what the emissions impact um, of achieving transformation points looks like for cement production, one of the largest uh, sources of emissions in the uh, in industry sector. Uh, so on the graph, you can see um, both our current trend scenarios and our transformation point scenario for um, the world and uh, for China, a major steel uh, producing country. Uh, we analyzed the emission reduction potential, assuming that uh, the use of local fuels will take off as soon as uh, possible. Um, also, that the power sector would be fully decarbonized by 2050, so that's what we discussed in, in the earlier chapters already, um, and um, that uh, innovative uh, solutions such as uh, CCS will contribute uh, to uh, emission reductions uh, in the medium term, so that's why I can see a uh, drop in after 2030 here. So um, combined, this could bring down sector emissions uh, to a Paris-compatible level, that's the good news. Um, reducing uh, emissions to around uh, 83 by around 83 percent from uh, current levels uh, by 2050 on the global level um, and uh, by around uh, 92 percent uh, in China. Uh, from, for more details also uh, please have a look at uh, our transformation points uh, memo on the website as well as uh, on um, our specific uh, industry uh, memo. So um, in conclusion, um, although transformation points are inside for solutions such as fuel switching, um, there remain substantial challenges in other subsectors, um, and a combination of new solutions will be required to fully decarbonize uh, uh, industry, and financial incentives will be needed to indust uh, for industries to invest in the deployment of uh, innovative technologies. Yeah, that's it for me, uh, Lisa. Yeah, great. Thanks, Yannick, and thanks everyone for your contributions. So this will be our last piece of input, then we'll go to the question and answer section. But I just wanted to point you to a resource that could be useful for you. Um, in this presentation today, we looked at three sectors and, and 
talked about how they were progressing and if they were um, headed towards this sort of transformation point or not. Um, on our website, climateactiontracker.org slash data portal, you'll find our newly redesigned decarbonization data portal. We launched the redesigned version about two weeks ago. Um, and we have this kind of data that we were presenting today for 41 different indicators. So if you're interested in a different sector and say, hey, but you didn't talk about what was happening with deforestation today, or um, I would like to learn more about meat consumption, you can look at those indicators through the portal. And in the portal you have two different options. Um, the view that we're showing here is the compare indicators view. And that's where for within a certain country, you can compare different sectors to each other. So what I'm showing now is China. And you can see the blue line is renewable share in electricity generation. And this is indexed to 1990. So all the values are normalized. So this is just showing you a trend. Um, but we see that renewables have really kicked off again since about 2005, and you see that S-curve starting to come in. And we can compare that with, for example, the coal share and the total primary energy supply, which is what you're seeing in purple. And see that that's generally leveled off, but maybe kicking up again, but that it's really projected to go down in the future. The other option, if you go to the next slide, is that you can compare countries to each other. So if, for example, a, um, an example from today, electric vehicle, or close to the example from today, so this is electric vehicles per capita, per capita in a country. And you can look at historically how Norway was tracking um, compared to the US in brown or the rest of the world, which is down in green. And this only goes until 2015, so that picture would even look different with updated data. Um, and we will be doing a data update soon. That will be coming out probably during the summer. And so we encourage you to look out for that as well. Next slide. So to wrap it up before we start um, with questions and answers, the key messages that we would like you to take home today are first that transformation points are reached when transformations take off. So this is when something that was previously new becomes the new normal. Um, and we think that this sort of dynamic can help us to reach the speed and scale that's needed to limit warming to one and a half degrees by the end of the century. And that the work is tough at first, but that it gets easier over time. Next, front runner governments can move systems to global transformation points through their ambitious action. Um, this could be, for example, how Germany or Denmark pushed renewables early on. This could be how Norway and China are pushing electric vehicles now that help to take the global system to that transformation point. In these three sectors, governments can increase the likelihood of reaching a transformation point and what they need to do renewable energy with storage is that they will need to modify market rules to allow storage to compete. They need to set targets for storage capacity additions, and they need to invest in R&D for technologies with a focus on interseasonal storage. For electric vehicles, they can follow front runner examples like Norway and implement financial incentives, install charging infrastructure, and provide other benefits like access to bus lanes or special parking. Um, to encourage consumer uptake of electric vehicles. And finally, to address industrial emissions, um, it will be key to work with industry to demonstrate the feasible t feasibility of technologies at a local level. This is, again, just proving that it can be done. And then also provide in financial incentives to um, support technology deployment. So with that, that's what we wanted to tell you today. Um, we hope that it was informative, and we would be happy to take your questions for the next 15 minutes. So you can raise your hand um, by clicking on the little hand button next to your name, and then we'll see it, and I can call on you. Or you can submit questions through the chat function, and I'll read them out.
Okay, then then I'll start with a question. So, Bob, on electric vehicles, um, you mentioned a couple barriers for consumers. So, for example, this issue with being worried that electric vehicles don't drive far enough. Um, from your experience, what do you think are the types of policies that could be implemented um, or even just information campaigns that could be implemented to overcome some of those barriers? Yeah, thanks, Lisa. I mean, the, 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 the range anxiety issue is one that, that, I mean, even in my own personal anecdotal version is when I first was thinking about an electric vehicle, I talked to others and I kept hearing that they had the range anxiety when they first bought their car and then it disappeared very quickly. You learn to, to deal with it. Um, and so there's this combination of the information, the, the different points I made, the information out there about the range and how most of us don't drive that far on a daily basis. The second piece is that the infrastructure becomes more common. Um, again, I've seen that around here in the Midwest of the U.S. where I am, where there are more and more charging stations. So that automatically takes away some of the of the um, issues about whether I'll be able to get home or not. And then, and then there's also the again this, this idea of just seeing other people driving and seeing other people with the cars. And so I think there's a it's a it's a combination of various things. And then add to that the fact that the ranges are getting longer and longer, to where if you have a 200 or 300 or 400 kilometer range, then it becomes far less of an issue. If it's 30 or 40 kilometers, then then maybe that that's a little bit more limiting compared to your standard way of of operating. But there's this, there, there is this combination that of the, all these pieces work together, and and we see more and more of the cars being more and more electric vehicles being adopted as this range anxiety issue becomes a non-issue essentially. Thanks, Bob. Um, other questions from the audience. There's one hand raised oh, yeah. from Yes. So we have Thibaut Le Mercier. Hi. Um, thanks to the whole team. <clears throat> great, great content. Um, um, I think that a few of you spoke about the, um, one of the important uh, driver for reaching those uh, points would be um, the opportunity to have a, a kind of a coalition of actors or, or of like a coalition of uh, partners, maybe from between government and, and sectoral uh, actors. Could you just elaborate on a bit on that? And, and maybe do you have a, a couple of examples that um, you have seen in the past? I'd be happy to take that, Lisa. Yes, go for it, Nicholas. Yeah, um, exactly. I think that's the whole issue of, of this tipping point, at least from my point of view. I mean, this is... Uh, is, is um, uh, standard basically that, that technologies take up in an exponential uh, uh, phase. But the, the main point is that a smaller group of governments can uh, really make that transformation happening and move faster and also with that take other countries along. And as we said, uh, the renewables is a, a very particular case where that um, has happened. Uh, electric vehicles is another one where it happened. I think industrial emissions is one where it has not happened. And I would hope um, that in that, those areas where, for example, hydrogen steel making is yeah, tested, it's uh, now in Scandinavia tested, for example, with the pilot plant, that you could think of uh, groups of industry and governments that take that issue and really move it forward. And with that, uh, show that it's working, uh, provide really fixed incentives, long-term feed-in tariff-like incentives for developing and deploying that technology and I, I think then we would really be a, a major step forward um, simple carbon pricing is, is good is helping but uh, would have to be set at a such high level that um, that i think we need in addition these kinds of smaller coalitions that really push it forward and as your question was where so high intensity uh, or heat or um, uh, fossil fuel free steel making I think those would be definite areas where one could do more thanks Nicholas um, so we have a hand up from Devendra
can't hear you. And there's also a, a question in the chat from. from yeah. Screen. Okay. Good. Okay, um, Devendra, we still can't hear you. Maybe I'll take the question in the chat from Dan for the moment, and if you also want to type your question into the chat. chat. Um, so the chat question from Dan was that, um, actually it's disappeared for me, but I think that the question was on Lulu CF and if this kind of dynamic can also work in the Lulu CF sector or if it's limited to the sorts of things like technology deployment. Um, does someone in particular want to answer that or I can go for it? Yeah, I mean, so the entire LUCF sector, of course, is, is complicated, but I think that what we do think about in the paper is that this can also apply to behaviors. So not necessarily just technology deployment, but also behavioral, behavioral deployment. And so if we think about some of the drivers for deforestation, for um, emissions from the LUCF sector, let's say if we think about meat consumption, for example, as a driver of agricultural land expansion that can lead to deforestation. Um, that's the kind of behavior that could be affected by this kind of dynamics. So if more and more people start choosing lower carbon diets that are less meat intensive or, or exclude meat entirely, and a few people, I mean, a few people already do that, more than a few people do that, but then friends start doing it, perhaps information campaigns help to support that. Um, I think that this is the sort of thing that can also expand in that sort of way, and that also touches on these neighbor effects that Bob mentioned, where seeing other people like you do things can lead more and more people to do them, and then you also get this, this S-curve-shaped growth or S exponential growth, one or the other. Um, Okay, then the question from Devendra, thanks, um, was expand on the recommendation to modify market rules to allow storage to compete. Yeah, definitely. Um, so it depends on the markets, but power sources are paid for all sorts of different things. So we think that you know when we purchase electricity, we're purchasing the electricity, but we're also purchasing other services that the um, power plants are providing to the grid. So an example of that is frequency regulation. There's power plants, um, so in our current system that is usually dominated by fossil fuels, power plants have these big spinning turbines and that's what maintains the frequency of the grid. If you have that fall down, then you get a blackout. Um, batteries can do the same thing. You can program them to pulse at the same rate and they can help maintain the grid frequency. And that's something that's already seen in South Australia, for example. But it's not in all markets that batteries or, or storage options in general can be paid for those extra services that they provide. Um, they can also work as, as peaker plants, for example. So in many systems now with um, fossil fuels, you have gas plants that can ramp up very quickly. Um, Whereas coal or nuclear, nuclear you can't shut off. Coal you can only ramp up and ramp down very slowly. Gas plants come on and off very quickly, and batteries can come on and off even quicker. Other types of storage as well. Pumped hydro can do the same. Um, so if you change the market rules that makes it possible for storage to be paid for these additional services that it's providing to the electricity system, um, then that can help make it more attractive um, for investors to invest in storage because there's a better chance to, to make profit on it. Maybe I can add to that. There's, there's currently also market situations where it's discouraged to, to put storage in the system. Sometimes if, if you um, uh, take the electricity, you pay a certain tax. And if you then take it out again, you pay another tax. So it's really discouraged and really working the other way around than it should. So, uh, but there are also front runner examples where the markets are set up in a way of Texas, for example, it would be one where these ancillary benefits of storage are auctioned. So they are asking for a particular service in this market and then whoever can provide it at a, at a low cost uh, will then get it and can provide it. So this is a different market, complete different market setup that is optimized to allow the storage to come in and to help system stability 
um, and help to regulate the, the, the whole system. So that's what's needed right now. Thanks. Okay. Um, so we have another question um, from Daniela. Um, the question is if we are measuring or planning to measure the impacts from the mining industry to get materials for electric batteries and so on. Um, are we considering recycling as a way to get heavy metals instead of mining? Um, and also pointing out that a lot of water is needed for the mining industry and that they're also um, high carbon emitters. Nicholas or Bob, do you want to take that? Happy to take it. If you're not, Bob, go ahead, Bob. I mean, I, mean, I would just make a first comment that, I mean, in this, in this particular paper, we were looking at, the, at these sectors at, at a fairly high level. But I think it's, it's clear that as we move forward with the energy system transformation in general and move towards the Paris Agreement, we certainly don't want to make mistakes along the way that, that would lead to, to negative externalities. So that these are things that should be looked at along the way whenever we're making these transformations. We know enough to know what, what sorts of uh, potential dangers are there and potential um, things that could go wrong, but that's why we have a lot of smart engineers and, and who, who can actually, with the proper policies, with the proper frameworks, we'll be able to see where, where to avoid those issues as well. So, so as, as part of this paper, that may not, be, may not be the focus, but I think it's in the back of everybody's mind that we need to, we need to look at that. We need to look at water issues. We need to look at um, land use issues. We need to look at, at materials use issues along the way here. I completely agree, and this is um, yeah, something we need to look out for. Um, and for recycling, for example, this is already happening. So um, for batteries, uh, people are uh, significantly thinking about now if electric vehicles take off, there will be huge amounts of, of used batteries that need to be recycled. And um, they are already setting up plans on how, how to do this. Um, that's, that's definitely very important and we have to be very careful about it. We focused here on electric vehicles, but that is not to say that this is the silver bullet. No, in transport, many, many different things have to happen. Uh, for first, avoid, so not travel uh, if you don't have to, then shift uh, moving to mass transit, uh, mass uh, or public transport or rail or whatever. And then if that can't be done, then it's private vehicles uh, and their uh, best, best go to electric. So not to misunderstand that electric vehicles are not, not the one silver bullet. It's one part of a big mix of things that need to happen. And they all need to be done in a very careful way not to have uh, negative sides, side effects that you hadn't planned for before. And if I would just jump in one more time really quickly, the, I mean, the, for example, in, in heavy freight transport on the road, it may end up being that hydrogen is a better solution, but then hydrogen will also depend on the electricity system and, the, and a decarbonized electricity system. So, so it's back to this point about this, we, we really need to think about this in terms of the entire system and going forward and looking forward, but also moving forward, how the, how the system interactions will be playing out. In, in through all, all three of the sectors we talked about, but others as well. Okay, um, thanks Bob and Nicholas, and thank you all for your questions. So our time is up, but thank you very much everyone who could join today. Um, we really appreciate you coming, and um, if you're interested in more information, we direct you to the report on our website, or feel free to send us an email at info at climateactiontracker.org, um, and we can follow up with you. Thanks. <laughs>